fellow students and friends of the Tomb Speaker Series, dear guests and professors. We, the students of the Tomb Speaker Series, are always searching for new exciting topics which concern all of us. Here at the Tomb, many schools and departments are concerned with the technical aspects of digitalization and artificial intelligence. But what about the social implications and consequences caused by the new digital age? How can our constantly aging society cope with the new challenges arising out of those technical developments? True to our motto, leaders and shapers, we always search for authentic personalities who are able to give us the answers to our most urgent questions. People dealing with such issues professionally are found in the branch of consulting. One of the leading consulting companies familiar to all of us is Roland Berger GmbH. Our guest tonight studied in Harvard and Paris. He started his professional career in investment banking before joining Roland Berger in 2001. In 2009, he became CEO. Please welcome with me Mr. Charles Edouard Bouet. It's working? Yes. Good. And um, I was told there's a screen with my slides, but there's this no, so Sorry. I have to manage. <laughs> All right, big group. Guten Abend. As Französische CEO von Roland Berger, einem internationalen Unternehmen mit Sitz in München, Deutschland, freue ich mich ganz besonders heute hier zu sein. Ich möchte mit Ihnen über ein Thema sprechen, das für uns alle sehr wichtig ist. Die Gestaltung unserer, unserer Zukunft und die Rolle der künstlichen Intelligenz, KI, in dieser Zukunft. Auch die TUM ist sehr wichtig für uns als Beratungsunternehmen. Wir waren zuletzt hier beim Business Game in April und die TUM ist eine Referenz in der Welt. Sie, die Studenten der TUM, sind für mich die Zukunft von Europa. Als größte Beratungsfirma Europa liegt uns die Zukunft unseres Kontinents sehr am Herzen. Eine Zukunft, die vom globalen Wettbewerb geprägt ist und sich in einem Umfeld abspielt, das immer mehr VUCA wird. VUCA bedeutet volatile, uncertain, komplex und ambiguous. Ich werde spä später noch darauf zu sprechen kommen und freue mich, nach der Präsentation Ihre Fragen zu bekommen und beantworten. Auch wenn Roland Berger ein Unternehmen mit deutschen Wurzeln ist, würde ich als Global CEO nun gerne auf Englisch weitersprechen. Es ist ein bisschen einfacher für mich. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to switch to English. Thank you. So I'm going to start with a what are we doing as a consulting firm? And uh, I'm going to start with a story, which is that um, I have two daughters. One is 14 year old, one is 17 year old. And they used to ask me since they were a child, Daddy, what are you doing for work? I used to say, I'm a doctor of companies. You know, I'm helping companies, I'm fixing them. They come to me like you go to the doctor and I'm helping them. Four years ago, I changed the story. I'm not a doctor anymore. Roland Berger is not a hospital or a doctor company. What we are is we're helping our clients to own the future. And that's what I want to talk to you today. Because the world is becoming VUCA, I'm not going to spend too much time on this. And in this world, 
what we are doing is helping our clients to go through massive transformation. And as I said, and this is the matter of my speech today, to own the future. Because everyone in this room, as students, as professors, as dean, as consultant, want to own the future. And what we've done is we have built our capabilities on three letters, K, T, C. Knowledge. Knowledge is the core of consulting. From Sun Tzu to Clausewitz to Michael Porter to Roland Berger, knowledge, and the knowledge in this room, is the core of everything in the human life. But knowledge in the world of today without technology is nothing. So that's why we expanded our capabilities in technology, creating Terra Numerata and many, many partnerships. And last but not least, as you know, capital is abundant, and capital helps fund companies, and it helps accelerating things. I'm going to switch now to something more interesting for you, which is how you own the future and what is the role of artificial intelligence in that world. To own the future, and I think that uh, you're going to tell me I'm a bit uh, basic, but you have to see it. You know, and I'm going to tell you, oops, the future is not ahead of you. It's here. It's by your side. I think everyone in this room needs to look at the low signals, what's going on. Because you, the future is what you will make of the action you take today into tomorrow. Too many people think the future is tomorrow. The future is today, and you have to see it. But seeing the future is nice. But if you don't act swiftly upon it, you don't own the future. And that's the purpose of my speech today. I've mentioned uh, two people, um, Elie During, who is a futurologist and someone who's uh, working on the future, and a German philosopher, who has written, Hartmut Rosa, who has written a lot of things on the acceleration of time, which you all know, and I'm happy that not so many people are playing with their phones today, but we're living in a world where we're living at the speed of tweet. 1,000 years ago, people were living at the speed of uh, the daylight, or the months, or the moon. But today, we're living at a very fast speed, so you have to act very fast. So, first question is, how do you see the future? And I'm going to tell you a true story, which happened to me, and I didn't see it, so I want to share with you so you can see the future today. This story is called the Hirschhorn Theorem. I think nobody in this room, raise your hand, do you know Kenny Hirschhorn? You don't know this guy. When I had the chance to work as a consultant on the merger between France Telecom and Orange, I was a partner at that time, it was in 2000, and I asked to merge the two strategy departments. At France Telecom, they had 50 people in that department, of course, engineers, very smart people like you. And then I ask, OK, Orange in London, how many people are doing strategy? The answer was zero. So I say, where is the department I can merge? So there is one person, he's Kenny Hirschman, he's a futurologist. He's heading the futurology department. I say, fine, you know, futurology, strategy. I go to London, meet this guy, and then, oh, my phone over there. He showed me a phone. At that time, it was like much bigger. He said, Mr. Boué, what is this? I said, it's a phone. Kenny said to me, what am I going to do with you? You're sure a strategy consultant? I'm giving you a second chance. So he showed me the phone again. And I said, oh, it's a Nokia. And then the guy says, OK, we have a problem. The next five years is known. It's going to be smaller phones. It's going to be 3G. It's going to be infrastructure. What this is, and he told me this in January 2000, what this is, can I get the screen on? <laughs> what this is when you get the screen? Ah, yes, sorry. This is the remote control of your life, OK? So today, for you, it's obvious. The future is you're all holding in your pocket the remote control of your life. This remote control of your life allows you to do your banking activities, book your car, buy things, surf, it's totally obvious. 
In 2000, when I looked at the guy, I was wondering if I was uh, talking to a Martian or a futurologist, which was the case. This person was fired for being crazy. <laughs> and he was, I guess. You have to know that at that time, Nokia was thinking that the SMS, which they had invented, was a useless idea. Imagine today if we didn't have the SMS. All of this to say that the future is by your side. Every day when you're talking to your professors, to your students, to your colleagues, to everyone, people are talking about the future. And there are many ways of looking at the future. The first way was the one I presented to you. There's other ways, which is you can map it. Three years ago, actually almost four, yeah, three years ago, I mapped what I thought would be the world of 2030. I'm not going to bore you with this now. But there are people, and I think you have to read it, that are looking at the future and how it will shape. So today, I want to talk to you about moving from the remote control of your life to the control of your life. Because remote control means there's another uh, uh, thing, a TV or whatever, which is not on the phone and which you're controlling, but it's not really under your control. And this is why I want to transition to the technologies. There are many, many technologies that by 2030 will change the world. And today we decided with the uh, Student Association to zoom on one, which has been the purpose of my latest book and my latest research, which is, oops, if it works, yes, artificial intelligence. Why? Because looking back, I think, and I'm convinced, again, maybe someone will be standing in 10 years in this uh, room and say, this was the Bouet theorem in 2017 in Tum, and he has been fired and whatever. <laughs> but I'm telling you that this will happen. Why? Because first, a lot of people, and Bill Gates was in this room a few weeks ago, a lot of people think this is the ultimate breakthrough, the holy grail of computer science. People in China have put this as a national priority because it's not only a topic for all of you in this room. It's a matter of geopolitical, geostrategic dimension. Of course, Jeff Bezos, of course, uh, Tantia from um, Microsoft. Everyone is talking about it. And what I want to share with you today is the same way this remote control of your lives changed our lives, but nothing changed. We still are in the tomb theater with a remote in our pocket. What's going to happen in the next 10 years, and you will be at the forefront of this, and you have a unique opportunity. You're entering, you are lucky, okay? I wish I were in your seat. You're entering a 10 years of a golden age of AI. If we want things to stay, and I come back to this later, we will have to change everything. In 10 years, the world will be completely different. Let me go through this. Why is it today? First, I think everyone in this room knows about AI, but there are so many people talking about it, and the definition is not very precise. AI is not about pattern recognition. It is not about prediction. It is about making decisions, artificial intelligence. Intelligent people, and you are all in this room, intelligent people, make decisions. Analysis is not useful. Whether you're a doctor, a professor, consultant, a manager, is the so what, the decision you make. Why now? Algorithms are very old. Deep learning was developed in Russia in the 60s. What has fundamentally changed is computing power, data availability, and now everyone is getting excited. I like this slide because this is a slide which shows the number of companies that I've uh, mentioned in the analyst call about AI. You can see that uh, until 14, nobody cared. But in the last 12 months, it has become a matter of everyone. When we look at two things, computing power, I'm not going to talk about the Moore's law because everybody can talk about it and read about it. What is important to know, I think you can tell your parents and your grandpas, is what you have in your pocket, this remote control of your life, has the processing power which the US Army 
and another had in 1984. So the Cold War between Russia and America was two iPhone fighting. So in this room, we have the, the, the superpower of the world if we were back to 1984. So again, you can tell, I like to take example because it helps from the people in the streets who vote and need to be educated to the more educated people, to the next generation to share examples. Second fact, we are producing every two years as much data that the humanity has been producing. That means that, of course, we can process a lot of data through deep learning, but it also means, and I will come back to this, that there is a huge opportunity for new players to acquire data. Because with your startup or with this new company, in two years, you would have accumulated as much as all the others have accumulated in humanity. So I, it's a very important point for me that today we think that data is power. Data is indeed power for deep learning. In the long run, it might not be a competitive advantage because you can accumulate data in the next years. Artificial intelligence is the third wave. I like this graph because on the first wave, which started in the 80s, you have famous companies. Microsoft, IBM, Nokia, Intel, Cisco. All these companies were the champions of your parents <laughs> and of my champions. Uh, in 2000, they peaked. The highest market cap in 2001 was Cisco. My daughters have no clue what Cisco is. Their market value is now 3% of what it was at that time. So we faced the first revolution, which was around computer power, internet, and mobile phone. And the winner of this battle were the US, and to a certain extent, Europe. Why Europe? Because you might not know, the European Commission was working on trying to stop portable computers and Microsoft to be on every machine of the European citizen. So they tried to find norms, they had a big commission, and after two years, the commission decided that they cannot stop it. And there was a, one guy, a young guy in this commission who asked the rest of the commission, Pascal Lamy, the former um, WTO um, chief, told me the story, and he said, oh, but there's a new technology coming called uh, phones, mobile phones, can I continue to search on the norms we could do on mobile phone? And the team said, okay, do it. Uh, after a few months, he came back and said, oh, I have, maybe we can do the uh, new norms called GSM, which was the thing they were thinking about the computers and the software, but it was too late. And that created our champions. In 2000, Deutsche Telekom, British Telekom, France Telecom Orange were the global champions. They were on top of the world, full of cash, full of data, and buying companies all over the world, unstoppable. At that time, Kevin was saying, this guy's gonna die. Of course, he was fired by these guys. So this first battle was won by people that don't exist anymore. Then we entered the battle of uh, Kevin, which is digital business model, smartphone, mobile apps, who won? The GAFA and the BAT. And today we don't speak about the champions from before because they're gone. The, the remote control of your life in your pocket is only 10 years old. So again, when I'm talking about the future, the past, and history, it's very important, you as students, you as the future leaders of uh, Germany and Europe, that you always reach out to the past. Who won that battle? The American and the Chinese, not the European. But now comes the good news. We're entering the next battle, and we have 10 years. Of course, they start with a competitive advantage, the same way that Microsoft, which, by the way, never, ever created any successful startup, despite lots of money, monopoly, and control of all your machines. That's why sometimes when people say that the GAFA and the BAT will control the world, I say, past is not a prediction for the future, but it's a good indicator. So the next $1 trillion company will be an AI company. 
It doesn't mean that the GAFA and the BAT will disappear because Microsoft is still around, IBM is still around, Cisco is roughly around, and Nokia is roughly around. But we are entering, and you are entering, the golden age of AI for that reason. And who could be the champion? I named some companies that we are working with at Roland Berger. We created in the last two years, actually I started the, the research after. You saw the map I showed you. I wrote this map in the summer of 14. And then on that map I said, okay, where is gonna be the future? And then I pointed AI. And then in December 14, I started the research all over the world on the AI topic. And then created partnership with companies like Sentient, is a San Francisco-based company. They have raised $150 million. They are the most financed AI company in the world. They were created by a French guy and a guy from Iran, who were the founder also of uh, Siri, which was a DARPA program called Kalo before. And they're doing just incredible things. We can discuss about what they do in the Q&A. Arago, you know, is a German company with a financing of 50 million. The Chinese name you have here is a company called Xiao Ai. They, are the f they have 95% of the chatbot, AI chatbot in China, serving all the banks, all the telecom operators, and serving in real time 350 million people. If you go to the data center, Max is a good friend, the founder, as part of my research. Uh, and the last company I mentioned is Tell Me Plus, which was founded by people from Oracle, which is uh, transforming IoT into um, artificial intelligence machine. So 2026, the world will be completely different. A few points. It will be like electricity. You will all have, actually, maybe your children in 20, 10, 20 years, will all have in their pocket a portable AI, which will completely change the way they interact with the world, and which will move from a remote control of your life to a total control of your life. Because this portable AI will be able to protect your privacy, your data on the local cloud. You will not have to interact with the third parties in the same way. Why did I put 1011? It's not a coding uh, line. It is just that when you move into AI, the world of today where you have this website where you are touching and going on 2D, 2D 3D, 4D, will be removed because this interface has been created for us, stupid humans. This interface has been created because we need to have something to read and touch. The machine we will have in our pocket will go through this, we go to the SKU, to the, 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 docu the document, the element you need, and bring it back. I mentioned the end of the GAFA and the BAT. People think I'm crazy. Uh, I give you three uh, data points, or three reasons why they could disappear. The first one I already mentioned is the history, that all the champions of the past, when they became rich and powerful, lost their agility. I was with an entrepreneur last week at a dinner, and he said, it's not possible. I said, John, go back 10 years before. Now the guy has $300 million in his bank account. 10 years ago, he had zero, and he had to find some money from parents and friends to uh, close the, the months. I said, John, Go back 10 years before. I give you not 300, 150 million dollars. There are two partners in this company. And I give uh, Jacques uh, 150, 150 to you. Would you have worked the same way? Jacques was also 300 million today. He's spending his year traveling in private jets, enjoying life, uh, spending money on paintings and stuff. He has no interest in startups. So John told me, you're right, because if I had 150 million dollars, I would not have started the company. I would have lost this kind of passion for, it doesn't mean that everyone loses the passion, but an organization that gets bigger loses, loses the passion. The second thing is, if you all have your portable AI in your pocket, do you want this portable AI to, call, to be called Google, Apple, Facebook, or Amazon? Or do you prefer it to be called Mr. and Mrs. Schmidt? Private, protecting your data, working for you, in us you can trust. I bet that this, if this portable AI has the right capabilities, you will switch because you know that the same way you didn't trust Microsoft and IBM in my time, in 2000, you, do, you will not trust these companies 
to all your really valuable personal data on your portable AI. And last but not least, as I said, because the data is being produced in such a massive way, it is very easy to catch up. It is very, very easy to catch up the data and the information. It will also be potentially the end of digital divide. Because anyone augmented by AI, by a portable AI, will be able to catch up with people that are more educated. It's the same as electricity. Today, everyone knows how to use electricity, apart from people who put the fingers in the plug, happens sometimes, very dangerous. <laughs> and that would be the same also for portable AI, so there may be people that cannot use it, but it will be a very small minority. And another point is, and I write it in the book, advertising will become entertainment. You know, we move from uh, trying to, we call it in French, reclame, trying to convince the people that this product is the best, with endorsement from stars, to more advertising, to more it will be entertainment. It's already entertainment, because you don't want to be uh, advertised. And in 2038, not the topic for today, can be for the questions, is another topic coming up for humanity the next 10 years after the next 10 years, which is the topic of singularity and how we, you actually, as the future of Europe, will handle the arrival of more intelligent machines and how we will have to evolve in education. So implication for you, because at least I want you to take some takeaway. Education and learning is going to change. Everybody is talking about MOOC, I'm talking about mice. With portable AI, you will have massive individual customized education. You can be with other people in the room to entertain because we are humans. But what you want to have is this individualized training. And with AI, you can do massive training without having to put everyone in the same classroom because it's individualized. For jobs, 50% of the job will be impacted. So you have to think carefully in which industry you want to work. And you have to make your brain work because it will be the key elements of human creativity innovation, decision-making, that will make a difference. Management will change. The company will change. The company you will operate in, or the company you will create, or the university will be what I call light footprint. Full use of technology, advanced organization, ecosystems, lighter companies, agile companies. And the culture will be the culture of the millennials and the culture of your kids. So the company will fundamentally change the way they operate. And last but not least, skills, I mentioned it, creativity, empathy. By the way, one of our three values, when I became CEO, we uh, reframe our values. We call it the three E's. Of course, excellence, because we are consultant. Empathy is very important. It's the, the, one of the human characters. And of course, entrepreneurship, uh, because this is uh, some of our trademark. Last but not least, the next 10,000 startups will be AI plus business. So I strongly encourage you to uh, get involved in the topic with Roland Magger or with your own company. So whatever your vision of the future after my speech or after me watching um, Kenny Hirschhorn, whether you think that there is a chan one chance in a, billion in a billion that we are not living in a currently in a simulated computer uh, game, which means that machines are organizing that we all feel this is a very interesting topic from 2017, while singularity has passed and we are all now in the matrix. Or you believe that privacy may be an anomaly of history? Or that the goal of the future is to eliminate work so we can all play? You, student at Tum, I'm strongly encouraging you to start owning the future today. Thank you. Merci, monsieur. Thank you. Um, I will go in, in English because your German is probably even better than my French. <laughs>
Um, if you ask in German, I will answer in French. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, is the CEO of Roland Berger still a consultant? Like, do you still consult somebody or advise somebody? When you are a cook, even if you are the head of the, the kitchen, you need to cook. You know, you cannot stay a consultant. I mentioned knowledge, technology, capital. You cannot stay on top of your work if you are not doing the work for clients. That's why I'm doing it a bit differently than I was doing before. I have clients where I take personal projects for CEO, board, or families. I do research on topics like artificial intelligence and then I embed it into the client work with my partners. Or I'm also kind of involved in some academics, boards, to also help the society. That's what I'm doing as the CEO of Ron Bayer. So consulting is my core skill. You need to keep it all your life. Okay, um, but the first thing what comes to my mind at least when I'm hearing the word consultant is that you are working a lot actually, um, like 80 hours or more per week even, no weekends, long flights and everything, um, but still you have written a lot of books. So how do you combine this? L writing a book is probably taking much more time than any student spends here at university and you have like a double full-time job besides. I think that you will all see, I think when you're a kid, you study and you think it's very difficult. <laughs> when you are a tomb, you enter, it's very difficult. When you get to work, you think it's very difficult. But so basically, you have to uh, take the challenges and adapt your organization of time, the way you work and leverage on your experience and capability. Uh, I travel a lot, so I was uh, discussing with the dean um, the count last year was uh, 65 nights sleeping in a plane. So, and I don't sleep much, so, and I usually, usually don't do long flights, so I do work in the, in the plane. Don't watch movie. Prefer to watch movie with friends or family <laughs> than my, on my own in the plane. Um, when I write a book, I do the book like a consulting project. You know, everything in life, a consulting project is very simple. You have a problem, you have resources, you analyze and you propose a solution. So basically a book is very similar. A book is you have an idea, you do some research, then you get some people to help you on some things, but it's your book. You know, I've written like eight books, seven or eight books. Each book is my book. I usually finish it you know, uh, on my own, uh, but I do it as a consulting project. A partner in a consulting firm is working hard, but he has consultant doing some of the, the work, a chef, in the kitchen, as a cooks, he has a, a master chef. He has a, and, but it's, it's cooking. So I think that uh, what people have to learn, and this is what I learned in my uh, training, you know, from the Jesuits to the engineering school to law degree to MBA at Harvard, and then consulting, is that you have to learn to learn, and you have to adapt yourself, and you have to be more efficient. And I think you said 80 hours. We work hard because we like it. I like consulting, but I also have a life. I'm really uh, you know, engaging all of you into uh, the four L's. Maybe you have heard about this, the four L's. Not yet. To be successful in life, you need to do the four L's. Living fully, living. Live your life. Don't give up things be to think that the future will be better. Live your life. Loving, love fully. Give more love than you receive in everything you do. Learn, learn all your life until you die. And legacy, leave something behind to your children, to your school, to your company, to your friends. That's the way I'm looking at life. And that's why I, I don't feel like working. And the day I feel like working, I will stop working and do something different. Okay. Um, you wrote <laughs> <laughs> at least I will try to keep it in mind. I, I do at least three of the four else, <laughs> <laughs> but not one. Huh? <laughs> um, you wrote an article or published it on LinkedIn. Um, the title was, what educational aims do we have in the age of AI? Hmm. Um, it was a lot about 
changing requirements uh, in the companies and so changing requirements for the students and the younger people so they can fit into these companies. What changing skills or changing requirements are you talking about like in the next 10 years? Like what should I um, put into my studies so I fit into a Roland Berger GmbH for example? Yeah, <laughs> Roland Berger is only uh, one part of the world. Huh? Uh, now I think we, we lived in the world where you were learning, working, retiring. That now is gone. You will be learning all your life, you'll be working most of your life, and you will be, have to retire earlier, otherwise you will enjoy life when it's too late and your body cannot enjoy. That's back to my... Uh, so you have to understand that too, all the students and the ones graduating soon, that unfortunately you thought it was over after too, and some of you might do a, you know, a executive program or whatever. No, it's just starting. So first, first thing is, Learning will be longer. Second thing is we will have to continue to educate the brain of our children to be ready for the machine. Because if we are making life too easy, you don't learn how to count. You don't learn how to memorize. You don't learn how to analyze. And then you become completely obsolete in the world of machine. So that's kind of the high level thing. When it comes to you personally, that means what? That you have to continue to be curious and learn every day. That you have to develop skills that are not the typical, I'm an engineer by training, not the typical engineer. Because communication skills, interpersonal skills, empathy, understanding human organization will be much more important when the, the organization becomes smaller, more agile. You need to understand how the groups is working. So, I think the, the skills will evolve, the duration of uh, training will evolve, and there will be much more blending be between the different cycles of life. Okay, and you, <laughs> you said one measure to achieve this goal is that you will apply something called like massive individual personalized e education or customized like mice in short. Um, which means that a lot of people, like it's already available on the internet, more or less, with um, online programs for studying, um, that much more people will have only one professor, for example, and will learn from him. It's individual still, but isn't it like um, challenging creativity? Because if you get all your input from a machine only, from intelligent machine, yes, but still, isn't it um, putting down creativity? Because if you are discussing with other people directly, um, are you talking about an artificial intelligence which is on the same level than another human being, or? Okay. Maybe there was a misunderstanding on your side. Um, the, the professors, today are limited by the number of hours because they want to do the four L's, so they have to do s not just teaching. Tomorrow, with artificial intelligence and their own portable artificial intelligence, they can interact with more students. So what they were teaching, whether it's on one-to-one, -one, whether it's on one-to-many, whether it's on articles, they can do. So that's the first thing. So, and you as a student, or me as a student, we will all be students, we will we, be able to interact with more people, not with less people. We will not have one teacher. What we will have is what I call the portable AI, the same way the professor has someone, something to demultiply himself, you have something to accompany you in life. And this thing is, is not your uh, superior intelligence. It's more something that uh, develops its skills based on your own skills. So your own personality, uh, your own way of doing things, your own empathy, your own innovation way will be embedded in this, this thing. So, to the contrary, it will give you much more time to focus on w the thing you just mentioned, which is innovation, creativity, uh, looking at different things, curiosity, not uh, reducing it. So, you are saying we all will have some kind of advice to uh, just to start with the cons probably of the AI, who is tracking everything we do 
at any time, always. Our le learning progress, what are we sleeping, where are we, what are we buying, everything will be tracked from this artificial intelligence, which is connected to other artificial intelligence. Yes. Yes, two, two points. Today, you're already tracked. When you woke up this morning, someone tracked you because he knew what time you woke up, unless you use a mechanical uh, machine to wake up. Then you took a car or a bus, someone tracked you, a different company. So basically today, we are all tracked. We are uh, what the, uh, some people call the, um, the liquid surveillance. Before we were in the air surveillance. Today we are, you are all under liquid surveillance. Someone is taking your temperature, knows your weight, knows everything about you. What I'm saying is, this is with the remote control of your life. With portable AI, which I did in 10 years, but if you talk to some professor, they will tell you maybe it's in five years. I did, I said 10 years to be safe. This machine will be protecting your own data. So yes, it will know everything about you. But as I said, it's very unlikely to be a GAFA because it will be a company that provides you a service, which is to keep this data, provide you an AI service, and will interact with other machines. Where it becomes interesting for us European, and I wrote uh, uh, something on this, is there's a need for a norm. There's a need for a protocol to interact between the different portable AI in the system. To, tomorrow, you, you, are, you want to order a car, or today you want to order a car, so you use a platform, a taxi platform, a Uber platform. Tomorrow, you don't need this platform. The driver, okay, when they're still drivers, but they will be still drivers until 2025 or 2030, the driver is sleeping in his car, the portable AI is on, you are having dinner with your parents, the machine knows that you are going home because you are, tomorrow you have an early flight or you have a work, orders search in the system for a portable AI that can transport you, they connect, then it checks if it's a, a licensed driver, everything that needs to be checked, you just don't do, have anything to do. There's no need to have the like or whatever or the rating, it just can connect with the portable AI of people who use this driver. A Mexican guy who was flying, he's sleeping, but machine is on, he can tell, okay, the driver was okay. So very rapidly, they can, you can strike a deal, the distance is known. So it's, it, we, as I said, we're entering a completely different world. I think we, you all have to understand, that's what I'm trying to do with through the books, through the speech, that this is gonna completely change the world, we are all thinking linear. We are all thinking the platform will still be there, the GAFA will be there, and privacy will be a problem. While what I'm thinking and what we are pushing at Hollenberger is that the world will be completely different. Okay, so you are telling that you have no concerns about um, exploiting all of this connection which is existing between every human being, in Europe at least probably, and also, uh, I just read an article online about cyber warfare and stuff like this. Hackers, everything, which is more than ever up to date. The Deutsche Bahn was hacked a few days ago. Everything, all this is no concern for you? Because uh, uh, okay. <laughs> because I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So, mm -hmm. the, the, uh, you were talking about privacy, you're talking about data protection, you're talking about... Ex exactly, because this is like connected more or less. If you have a device which ha has all information about you in one place, more or less. If you, if you, right now, you have different companies, different data centers, everything is like at least a little bit split up still. If everything is just saved in one place, isn't it much e easier for criminals to hack these devices or even for, for companies or states, governments, Okay, there are a couple of questions in your question. Mm -hmm. uh, if, you, if you look back in history, what was the thing that had to be protected the most in small cities? It was the bank. Because this is where your money was, and this is where the wealth of every citizen was. So everyone wanted to be sure the bank is safe. You know, it started in the far west. So tomorrow, now we have cut the bank into pieces, so as you said, there are many people having the data from you. It is likely that in the future, I mean, I'm almost sure that in 10 years, the data, your data will be gathered in order to protect yourself, to avoid that this data is 
given to people that you don't know, because today, most of the data on you is given, of course, piece by piece, to people you don't even know. That will open a real topic, which is cybersecurity, because we will, the same way that in the far west or in the early industrial edge, we have to protect the banks, we will have to protect this safe, and I'm sure that the uh, encryption, the security, will increase when we reach the quantic uh, computers, and it will be another topic. But this will be the most important priority to protect the data of the citizen. But it should be already the, the, the case. It's not because the 200 people have the data about you that it's not a problem. I think it's a problem. Tomorrow, I would like this data to be yours, protected in your self-cloud, and of course, that the protocol are protecting it to the maximum security. You cannot ever, 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 uh, ever be 100% safe. Some banks were attacked or stolen, but in the future, this will be the most priori the priority of all the government. Okay. I I think this is a good point. I hope it will work out, even if I'm not sure about this yet, because it's not working right now, and I tr they are trying pretty hard, I guess, mm -hmm. already. Um, another problem which arises when we are talking about AI and digitalization is that a lot of jobs and a lot of companies with low requirements um, will disappear. You um, already talked about this in different articles online. Um, how is Roland Berger, uh, as a consultancy, um, helping uh, companies to go this step and don't uh, lose all of their employ uh, all of their low lower qualified or older employees? And how 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 can we handle this problem with these people? Yeah, again, three or four questions in the qu one question. So. <laughs> <laughs> Multiple missiles. Uh, it is true that technology is impacting jobs. Roughly a half of the job, maybe more, will be impacted by technology the same way they were impacted in the past. We as consultants are helping our clients to adapt, to stay competitive. And that's part of our work. But also as a, a German company of, you know, a European company of German origin, it is the social aspect is very important to us. So what we've been doing in the last five years is to uh, really do study on the social impact, you know, start to talking to the government on how we uh, reskill these workers, what type of uh, safety net will be necessary. Because I don't think as, we, as European, we believe in a full capitalism where it's let the best win. And that's a topic which is very important to, to, uh, to us. But again, to take the third question, which is, was in the, in the, in the same question, the priority for all of you, for the government, in the next 10 years, is not to take care of the problem of unemployment of 2030, is to take care of the better battle of AI, which is taking, care, taking place now. And if we don't work on norms, on cybersecurity, on protocol, on helping the startups, we would have lost two battles, the battle of unemployment and the battle of AI. So our priority at Roland Berger is to take care of this topic that you mentioned about employment and social responsibility, but to put the attention and the spotlight of our client on the real topic, which is the next 10 years. So until the artificial intelligence arises, more or less. But for example, because this was, I, I was Googling on the internet and went to rolandberger.com to okay. inform myself about what we are talking today. And for example, one, you have stated 10 commitments on rolandberger.com, which mm -hmm. is the commitments of Roland Berger. And the 10th commitment was, um, we are proud of what Roland Berger stands for and take pride in our firm's and colleagues' accomplishments. This means that your work, I'm still talking about this generation which will be lost in the artificial intelligence age. Um, their work, is they are proud more or, or they are proud of what they are doing, and it will it will be very hard for people because you were talking in an article about the unconditional basic income, for example, for one solution to this problem that people are not able to work 
or uh, fulfill the requirements. Um, if they lose this and just get like a, a unconditional income as a charity, isn't this like a little bit offensive? Or how how do you handle this? What, what is your idea? It, it, it's it's a good good point, good question. I was on a panel with a few months ago in Beijing with the Dean of Yale and some other people, and we had this debate mm -hmm. vividly in the in the row. Uh, what all of us, our parents, any worker, even the uh, people cleaning, want in life is a sense of uh, fulfillment, mm -hmm. pride. You want to, uh, to have meaning to your life. You know, there's a, a quote which I really like, uh, which is famous, but uh, people forget. You know, when John Kennedy made his speech on going to the moon, it was an incredible speech. Then the journalist came to uh, Cap Canaveral to discuss with employees. And they, there was uh, this very empty hall and this guy cleaning the floor. And the journalist said, what are you doing? It's empty, there's nothing. And the, and the guy said, I am working on putting someone on the moon. And I think, you know, at the end of the day, this is a sense of purpose. So what we need as a society is not to have people left over, is to make sure that everyone has a sense of purpose of what he's doing and is as a fulfillment. That might need to have some basic income because he has no other source of revenue, but he might be helping elderly, he might be doing some creative things, he might be just doing online gaming with some other people, you know, because there's no age for that. Yeah. So I think we are entering a society which is, I call it entertainment, where there will, there will be a group of people that have a, a different type of work. What we need to make sure is that we enter a world where everyone can find a sense of purpose in life. And the sense of purpose, as Arthur Clark said, is not only work. And this is where I had an argument with the, the Dean of Yale because he was saying, work is my only passion. And, I was looking, and, I said, and someone was asking, you must have another passion in life apart from your kids and your dog. He said, oh yes, I love music, but I'm a very bad musician. But I said, I have a good news for you because with artificial intelligence, you will become at least a good musician. So you can do music all day if you have no, uh, no one to teach. Because at the end of the day, we have not been made for work. We have been made to do something with our life, to help others, and to go at night and feel good about what we're doing. And then back to my legacy point. And when we die and we look back, we said, I fulfill something. You know, it is finished, but I achieved something. Okay. <laughs> um, unfortunately, <laughs> we are, uh, yeah, the we are the time coming to the end of our talk. So one last question, which is probably the most interesting for all of us here. Um, if you are going to a shop in the view, do you have some advices, at, uh, like not only that I should shave and get your um, business card afterwards, do you have advices for us? I think be yourself. You know, I was a student at Harvard Business School and I was preparing for the interviews. I think the biggest mistake you can make is uh, not to be yourself, because at the end of the day, what we're looking at Roland Berger is what I call good people. You know, people who are good skills, they have the basic, you know, the good education, the good skills, but they are good personalities. We don't want faker. You know, because if you come to Roland Berger, one of our strengths and our weakness, but that's our strengths, is diversity. You come as you are. So of course, at the interview, we check that uh, the person who comes as he or she is, uh, is okay and a good person, but be yourself. Because this is, this is the way we've been for 50 years, and this is what I intend to, this company to be for the next 50 years, at least when I hand over to my successor. This is a good ending, I think. Thank you. We will now have a short Q&A where you all have the chance to ask directly the CEO of Roland Berger, Monsieur Bouet. So just raise your hands. There's a microphone for... Table? Okay. Over there. Oh. Yeah, Mr. Uh, 
Uh, okay. Then can, you at can you at least state your kind of name and what you do? So I, uh, because I'm blind, I have uh, 600 people in front of me. So. Yeah. yeah, Mr. Boy, thank you very much. My background: I'm a neuro engineer, and we deal with machine learning, AI, and brain-machine interfaces. And my question is basically: when it comes to company valuation, what is most important? Is it the algorithms, the access to data, or the data itself? Ah. Let me, let me start. The, it, it's three things. First thing is the quality of the algorithm or the technique you're using, okay? If you're using something which is uh, not original, not advanced, it doesn't mean much. The second element is the quality of the team. You know, when I look at the value of a company, I look at the quality, intrinsic value of the technology or the algorithm. Second, the team. And last but not least, the business application. You know, can these things work? So, in this order. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but come to me after, we can talk about business. Okay, so personal <laughs> invitation, just write it down, exactly. Here, the sir in the white shirt. They all have white shirts, so. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bowie, thank you very much for giving me the chance to ask you the question. So before I ask a question, I want to raise a little story because uh, about a month ago, I read a news from Morgan Stanley. They claim that they developed somehow artificial intelligence that could potentially replace the analyst job in, in for example, in investment banking industries in the future. So what I would like to ask is, what's your opinion? Do you think in the future, if the investment bankers or the, maybe even the consultants will actually disappear because of artificial intelligence. Okay, I have a good news for you, it will not disappear. Uh, but it will change. It's good news for you. <laughs> for, for everyone, okay. No, but I'm not a banker, okay, so. Um, you know, technology has been changing the work of bankers in the last 100 years. The first consultant was Sun Tzu. He was consulting the king and he didn't have any uh, technology. So technology has already changed. Today we produce uh, PowerPoint and slides before we were having uh, someone with ink doing the slides. What will change fundamentally is that people getting into my company and other company will come with this augmented tool, this portable AI, and therefore they will have a different job. So I believe there will be less differentiation between the younger and the older, uh, more opportunities to go fast in the system, longer careers, but the job of analyst, which is to uh, do the Excel spreadsheet and type something, a lot of this thing will disappear, but you will still have a job. It just will be a completely different job, much more selective, much more augmented, but the good news for you is, I don't know when you graduate, is uh, you have still 10 years ahead of you, so you can be a, par a partner in a consulting firm or a partner in a bank within this time frame before things happen to your job. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Some Question more questions, there. probably from this yeah. part of the room. Yeah. Is there any, any, any? Uh, would be easier there, yes. Okay, already too late. Uh, Mr. Boyu, uh, thank you very much for coming and uh, uh, for your talk. Uh, I have one question. It is concerning the conse political consequence because, you know, the uh, Facebook revolution or social media revolution, we have uh, changed it at all, like, um, uh, political uh, behavior of people. What do you think about after uh, artificial intelligence revolution? What ha will happen uh, in the world? And what will be the political um, uh, context of the world? Okay. <laughs> this is the one trillion dollar question. Uh, Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we answer with a one million dollar answer. <laughs> uh, now, I think it will, it will, it will have a, a good and bad consequences. The good consequences is, you know that the big buzzword of last year was the post-fact truth. That a, a politician can speak and say something totally wrong, and people in the room say, oh, great, and, you know, because they don't check. 
So I think in the world of portable AI, there will be some people in the room checking, and it will be you know, much more balanced. So I think a lot of the things we've seen on populism and fear will be reduced because there will be, as I said, less digital divide and people can have more access to the truth and not just the Google search, which sometimes is not the truth because you know that people are paying to be first on the line. So if you are Googling and you're getting something, it's not always the best answer. The second thing is, it will mean that government will have to evolve. Because if everybody is augmented with a portable AI, not a remote control of your life, but a control of your life, there are topics about privacy. There are topics about how the government is looking at your data. There are topics about how we vote. You know, we might not have to go to a room to vote because you can just secure and vote. So I think it will fundamentally change the way government have to operate. And it will be good things, as I mentioned, but also some challenging things because the government will have much more pressure from the uh, citizen. Augmented citizens are likely to be putting more pressure on government. Is and politics will be a different uh, business. Is this enough of an answer? I think so. Okay, one last question. Hi, hi. Um, I'm Daniel Schaefer. Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, hi, I'm Daniel Schaefer. Um, I'm studying physics. And the question that I want to ask you tonight is that you seem to have quite a, a refreshing outlook. Um, and I think that seems to be kind of lacking for a lot of people who are working in upper management um, and management in general. Um, how do you feel that you manage to, you know, keep that open outlook in when, when others just cl clearly fail to do so. Okay. Um, I think there's, there's one thing you need to all keep in this room, and uh, if you are in this room, it's because you were driven by curiosity. I think that you need to keep, all of you in this room need to keep being curious. You know, the serendipity, if you apply machine learning and deep learning, and you try to normalize everything, you know, you would wake up at the same time every morning, you would do the same things, and the same coffee, and the same everything, then you will lose this thing that makes our life spicy, this curiosity. So what I'm doing is, and sometimes it's a nightmare for my team, is if something pops up, an email, a connection, something that I think is interesting, I will tell them we have to explore. And then they say, ah, oh, again? But then after, and after many years working with me, they understand what I'm doing. You know, it's, it's part of the job of a consultant to make sense of what's happening. It's part of all, what needs to drive us. When I became CEO of Roland Berger, the night I was elected by my partners, with 92% of the votes, I stand up and I said, now that you have voted, I'm gonna tell you what I'm gonna do. <laughs> I'm not gonna just run a consulting firm. This is very boring, you know? What you have to be is you have to keep your life being curious. And if you can only remember one thing from tonight is stay curious. Believe in encounters, believe in serendipity. You will only master your destiny if you are curious, you see the future, you size the opportunity. You will never regret having explored the path that didn't work or that worked. You will always regret that you didn't open that door. And that will kill you the day, you know, the last day of your life. You say, I should have opened that door. That's my biggest regret. So try things, be curious, live your life. The four L's, I hope it's helping. I think also the four L's are a good uh, <laughs> chance to end this talk tonight, uh, to this evening. I thank you very much, Mr. Bui, for joining us this evening. Um, we will have a group photo now. Um, and our leader of the Tim Speaker Series will give you your present. We I'm very curious. For you. First, a warm round of applause for <laughs> Mr. Bray, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, by now it is a tradition that our guests are always getting a present. And we have here a present of a former Tomb startup, which is called Braufestchen. You can brew your own beer. We have it for you. So thank you for your time. Here's a present. 
And now I need the next slide, please. Can I say one thing about the gift? Yeah, yeah, you can. You know, I've uh, worked and live in uh, five countries. And there's a common point about these five countries. They all brew incredible beers. Germany, France, China, and the US. Thank you. <laughs> and now, if you felt like we could change something or you want to help us organize such awesome events like this one with Mr. Bouet, feel free to join us. There's our email address. Take a quick uh, picture or talk to us upstairs at the snacks and beer. Thank you.